I think most of us would agree with the fact that we want to live a better life. Um, I don't know about you, but I am definitely one of those people who likes to be in the know about what things are better than other things. Uh, and this text this morning, if that's you, uh, is just for you. This is your day. If you want to know how to live a better life, if you want to know what better things exist, uh, the author or the, uh, the teacher in Ecclesiastes comes and he's offering you four better ways to live in this world. Uh, this doesn't sound like our normal sermons here, but I'm here uh, to give you four life lessons for better ways to live. Uh, after four weeks of material from the preacher in Ecclesiastes that require us to take a pretty sober look at the world uh, and to acknowledge our way in the world and to have to force uh, the determination that our way of working in this particular world just isn't working, uh, whether it be the fact that uh, our, our quest for gain is not working or our happiness projects aren't working or time is not on our side, that reality is not going to work out for us or the re reality that justice is delayed, justice isn't working in this world. This week, the teacher of the book comes to tell us that according to wisdom, there are certain things that work better than other things. He comes with good advice, uh, even if it's not all good news. And so the first thing we want to see this morning is four betters. Four betters. Uh, and the first one he gives us is the better of non-being. Uh, the first thing that he wants us to know that is better is he says it's better to be dead than living, and it's better still if you've never been born at all. Um, well, that didn't come out of the gate quite the way we had hoped, uh, but just sit with it for a second. Um, why would the teacher say this is better? I mean, this doesn't seem like godly counsel or a biblical view of the world. But his reasoning is very simple. He says the reason that's true is because of the very real pain of oppression in this life. The teacher lifts his head again and he says, and I saw. So he's looking around the world, this world of toil, and he says, as I'm looking, I beheld all of these awful things, things that are hard to take in if you are willing to take a good look at them, which most of us simply are not willing to do. Um, he saw, notice, all the oppressions done under the sun. So he sees the exploited, and then he sees the power of those who exploit them. And with those two things together, he says it's seemingly impossible to put these things to an end. We have the oppressed, and on the side of the oppressors is power. And I mean, this is just the way the world's going to go on, that man exploits his fellow man. He saw the tears of the oppressed staining their weary and worn faces. And as he's looking at the oppressed, what is he seeing? He's seeing the poor and the enslaved the fatherless and the widow, the foreigner and the forgotten, the weak, those who just don't quite fit, the misfits and the freaks. And he sees their pain for what it is, and as he looks, it pains him. It's hard for him to take it all in. But his pain intensifies when he sees not just the oppressed, but he notices the oppressors as well. And he takes account of who is on the team of each, who's on whose side. We have the oppressed, who's on their team, the oppressors, who's on their team. He says, and I notice on the side of the oppressors was power, that they had all of the mechanisms of power on their side. And he says, on the side of the oppressed, he says, there was no one that would comfort them. As he looks at the world structure, he sees that the powers that be exploit very often those who are underneath them. And then he sees the exploited living then an agonized existence. What he doesn't see is anyone coming to their aid. When he talks about comfort, he's not just talking about someone to come put an arm around their shoulder, as great as that is. You know, empathy is a wonderful thing. But he's saying they need a comforter who can actually get them out of this situation, not just kind of endure with them in the midst of it. They don't have any heroes or saviors for their plight. And this grieves the teacher. And people of God, I mean, it should grieve us a whole lot more than it does. We will only understand what he says next and why he says it's better to either be dead or to not exist. We will only understand those kind of hard words if we are willing to take a hard look at what he actually is seeing. 
And it's hard to do, uh, especially for the likes of us. I mean, we've been raised with a certain amount of comfort. Uh, we have been given uh, a certain amount of, uh, we, we have a certain amount of freedom in this nation. Most of us have a certain amount of wealth, especially by global standards. We have been blessed in various and manifold ways. And when you have that sort uh, of comfort, what you typically don't do is go looking for pain in the world to just kind of stare at it and take it in. We often avert our eyes from that sort of thing. And our communities are often built in such a way where we can avoid even coming in contact with those kind of things, especially on this side of the country. But of course, just because we don't see suffering and exploitation in its most raw forms in our neighborhoods, it doesn't mean that it isn't real. It doesn't just go away because we don't look at it. And the preacher in this text wants to force our gaze, and when he does, you will notice what we find. We find the vulnerable and the weakest among us being exploited at every turn. I mean, consider what we see when we look. You know, if you were to look even not too far in our recent past, you see places like Auschwitz and you know, rail car after rail car of Jews and the often forgotten gypsies being unloaded like cattle, possessions taken and categorized much like their persons will be taken and categorized. You see men being separated from their families, wives, from their husbands, children, from their mother's arms. And if you've never been there to see it, to this day you will find things like a large room, half the width of this room, filled from floor to ceiling with human hair that had been shorn from those removed from these uh, train cars once they were stripped naked, once all of their possessions were taken and categorized, they were often or always shaved and put away in different categories. In this room uh, of human hair, you will see on one side a loom, a weaving loom, and into one side of the weaving loom is all this kind of tangled and matted human hair being pushed through. On the other side, thanks to German ingenuity, a well-made blanket that would then be used to cover these now uh, uh, prisoners in this internment camp. And this is just one small example of the atrocities they faced at the hands of their fellow man during this period of time. When we look, we see the factories of Bangladesh, uh, even this one uh, not too far back, 2011, 2012, where for years this eight-story building had been complained about by the workers, mostly female workers, because of the dire situation of the economics in Bangladesh. Uh, that they, they complained that it was built on a poor foundation, it was built in a swampy marshland, and there were cracks all throughout the building that were visible by those working in it. But their pleas concerning the dangers were unheard by the powers who would profit off of their very cheap labor, making very cheap garments for those of us who live in the West. And in one day, 1,000 women who had no choice in their poverty but to work and take the risk of going day after day in conditions like this would die as their workplace collapsed on top of them, crushing them in an instant, leaving many husbands wifeless and many children motherless. The teacher would draw our gaze closer to home and let us know that it just doesn't happen out there on the far reaches of what we call the third world. It happens even here. I mean, he looks and wants us to see Jennifer Denon and her live-in boyfriend, Clarence Reed, Together, the two of them abused Jennifer's then four-year-old little girl so badly that when the police found her, her eye was blackened, she had dried blood on the corner of her mouth and deep purple bruises over the entirety of the bo her body because she had been zip-tied and beaten by the couple week after week for most of the entirety of her life. When the child was asked by the police officer what was her name, she replied, Idiot because she had been called it for so often and for so long that it was the only word that sprung to mind when someone finally asked the question about getting to know her. Koheleth would say to us, take a good long look. Take it in. You see, time doesn't permit us to talk about the countless thousands who are sex trafficked around the world, the immigrant who's taken advantage of because of those who would profit from them knowing full well that they can do whatever they want because fear of deportation will keep them silent even when they're mistreated. The list of oppression in this world truly is endless 
if you have the will and the stomach to even consider it. And then it's in light of this that the preacher says, these things are better. Those who are already dead are better off than the living oppressed. And even better are those who are never born to see the atrocities that man will visit upon other men. And he says, you know, uh, to us who would say, well, that seems unchristian or ungodly, he would say, well, tell that. Tell that to the child beaten every day or the girl used as a sex object for men's lust until she's not considered young or good enough anymore and then she's discarded like a piece of material. Or the person who's treated as a machine, uh, machine worthy only of labor but not for dignity. And none of them have the power to change it and say, that's your life for the rest of your life. For them, death may be the first bit of rest they ever get in this particular world. I mean, we can say very easily things like, give me liberty or give me death. But what of people born into this sort of circumstance? For them, it would have been a kindness to not know life rather than endure the living hell in which they existed. Some of you know the Scottish poet Robert Burns. He captured this sentiment well. I won't read the entirety of the poem. But his dirge that is entitled, Man Was Made to Mourn. The, probably the most famous line, if you know of it, is man's inhumanity to man makes countless thousands mourn. Listen to what he writes. He says, if I'm designed... If I'm designed yon lordling slave by nature's law designed, then why was an independent wish ever planted in my mind? If not, why am I subject to his cruelty or scorn, or why has man the will and power to make his fellow mourn? O oh, death, the poor man's dearest friend, the kindest and the best, welcome the hour my aged limbs are laid with thee at rest. The great and the wealthy, they fear thy blow. From pomp and pleasure they're torn. But, oh, blessed relief for those, the weary laden mourn. See, the teacher doesn't suggest that oppression will get better in this life, but he says, hey, at least death does come. And that's a moment of respite for him. And while death might be better, something in us discerns that just can't be best that can't be what we're waiting for but he goes on he says there's a second better it's the better of contentment much of the fuel of course that feeds the fire of toil according to the author is the envy that one has of his neighbor the envy that he speaks of of course is the knowledge or even the suspicion of someone getting ahead of us or having more than us that they might be gaining something that we aren't able or willing to gain Envy is that resentful self-awareness of the advantage that someone else has over us. The teacher sees man eyeing up his neighbor and viewing his neighbor not as a community member, but as a competitor. And saying, I want what they have, or if I can't have what they have, at least I want them to lose what they have so they're not above me. As Gore Vidal put it pretty uh, pointedly, and uh, unfortunately we can relate with, he said, every time a friend's a friend succeeds, I die a little. Uh, you know, why is that? Why are our hearts so crooked that even uh, when, when people who, who we love and hold dear get something that we've wanted, it's very hard to celebrate with them? Well, it's this reality of envy. This envy that causes us to see who's above us and try to step up to get where they are and in so doing step on those who are below us, what he just talked about in these first three verses. It's that same envy that fuels our willingness to oppress others to get what we want. And he wants us, of course, done with both actions. He's telling us that the rat race, this quest to catch up or to stay ahead, just can't be won, and he would offer to you that there's a way to opt out of it. And if we agree with it, we might ask, well, how do you do it? You know, what's the best way? If we really can't win at the rat race of life, if all this toiling really brings us no gain, what should we do? And he offers a few options. He says, there are those who would just quit altogether. We can fold both of our hands. Notice what he's saying there. He says, there's one who folds both of his hands and then he eats his own flesh. What's he saying? Well, folded hands aren't working hands. And so he's saying, this, this one decided he's opting out altogether. I just won't work at all. I quit uh, and I'm just going to indulge in a life of utter laziness. And he says, that won't work. That's destructive. You'll end up eating your own flesh. 
So quitting the work game altogether is off the table, which some of us are very sad about. Uh, he says there's another option. You can open both hands wide and chase and chase and try to fill them both. Two hands full of striving. This picture is one chasing and chasing with no rest, no Sabbath, only striving, only working. But he will be exhausted in the end, and you can't hold on to wind anyway. He says there's a better way, and the better way is the one in the middle. One handful of quietness is better than two hands full of striving. So if you can, picture it in your hand. He says there's one hand, you know, holding a shovel, and the other hand is holding, you know, a margarita. Or, or, you know, one hand is holding a shovel, and the other hand is holding a book that he enjoys. You say, you've got to have what we would call in our culture work-life balance, although not many of us have it, but this is what they propose to us. He's saying, you should work hard enough to where you produce enough to take care of your own and to enjoy it, but you should also actually enjoy it and not just keep striving, not keep gaining for the sake of gaining, thinking that that's getting you anywhere. Work is something that he says we should do, but we should also enjoy the fruit of our labor. And in part, that is exactly why we labor. There is a foolishness, according to the author, in having and never enjoying. Maybe you've met these people. You know, you're in a Presbyterian church. Uh, The Scottish are famous for it. The Dutch are pretty good at it. Uh, You know, they save and save and wait and wait and hold and hold, and then they're dead. And they never enjoyed any of it, but, you know... The, the savings and the security were there. Uh, and he's saying that's a foolish way to live. If you work and work and never enjoy the fruits of your labor, that in and of itself is a vanity. It's foolishness. Contrary to our way of thinking, more is not the answer according to the teacher. As Proverbs says, you know, don't overwork to be rich. That's foolishness. But work and enjoy what you have. Contentment is, according to the author, the better way. Chesterton put it this way, there are two ways to get enough. One is to continue to accumulate more and more and more. The other is to desire less. Um, The author of Proverbs puts it this way, a heart of peace, contentment, gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. Clearly, for the teacher to be poor and oppressed is not great. I mean, he says it's so bad Uh, it's better not to be born at all. But he also acknowledges laziness is inherently self-destructive. That's not the way forward. But just as bad as striving to be rich and thus not stopping to enjoy what is and being content with what you have. He says that's just as deadly. That isn't some better way of life. And a lot of times it gets sold to us culturally as some higher form of existence. Our society doesn't want you to believe this, and social media is trying to kill you uh, in this area. A study conducted jointly by two German universities found rampant envy on Facebook. The researchers found, so, you know, only for old people, the researchers found that one in three people felt worse after visiting the site and more dissatisfied with their lives. The study goes on, and the, uh, the, the, the head of the study quotes, is quoted as saying, we were surprised by how many people have a negative experience from Facebook with envy, leaving them feeling lonely, frustrated, or angry. You know, a study has been done pretty famously from Princeton University. It's used in all of these, you know, new books on happiness and this quest for happiness, where this reality of, you know, does money buy happiness? And so they kind of worked out this formula where they have this happiness quotient. And they said, like, basically, you know, at least 10 years ago, I guess it's probably almost 20 now, uh, They said, you know, if you make $75,000 a year, once you get to that number, your happiness does not increase in any kind of noticeable way until you start making something close to like a half a million dollars a year. So somehow between that range, 75 to 500,000 or something to that effect, says there's no major change in happiness. It says because once you hit a particular number, and of course California, the number might be different, You know, you've got what you need, the basics of safety and security, a little bit of joy and happiness. Uh, And once those needs are met, your basic needs of existence, he says, money doesn't bring any more joy just in its accumulation. Contentment, then, he says, is better. But, of course, his having to tell us this 
And us not quite believing him shows that it's still not the best. As better, as much as it is better, we still want other things. Why is that in our hearts? You know, as much as it's better, why is it so hard not to envy those around us? And so he goes on to the third better. And he says, it's better to have friends. I mean, you can hear the Beatles singing as you read this text. You know, I look at all the lonely people. Where do they all come from? Notice, toil causes us to oppress. It's fueled by envy. And those two things, oppression and envy, can separate us from one another as mankind and our humanity. The first thing he wants us to see is this hard worker, this guy who just won't stop working. He achieves and achieves, but he's all alone. He doesn't have any brothers or sisters or children, no, no wife. And he says, you know, this man never stops to ask himself, why am I toiling and not enjoying anything that I'm doing? And he says, you know, for whom am I toiling? And the built-in answer is no one. You're doing this for no one and for no reason. That's vanity. And so he says, it's better to have a friend. Two are better than one. He says you get more done, and you actually enjoy what you're doing more if you have a partner in doing it. And then he says, you know, he uses this traveling metaphor for life. He says, look, we're all walking through this journey of life, and it's so much better if on this particular journey you have someone by your side. If you fall down or fall into a pit, there's someone else there to rescue you out of it. Woe to the one who falls, and he's alone. If you get cold, you have a warm body at night, to help uh, you know, uh, bring up your temperature. If stuff starts to go down, someone has your back. And he says, that's better. It's better to live this life in relationships with others, to have friends. This isn't just a metaphor for marriage, though it gets used that way often. It's for any sort of true communal relationship. We live in a culture and a time that pretends at community, but thrives in loneliness. You'll notice the CDC's numbers concerning life expectancy prior to COVID and all of these things had our life expectancy down to the same rates recently as were true in the 1915, uh, the era of 1915 through 1918. And one of the main upticks causing the trend of our decreasing life expectancy was suicide. Boston Globe wrote an article, The Biggest Threat Facing Middle-Aged Men Isn't Smoking or Obesity, It's Loneliness. Many of you have read the famous words of Thomas Wolfe, who wrote, The whole conviction of my life now rests upon the belief that loneliness, far from being rare and a curious phenomenon, peculiar to myself and a few other solitary men, is the central and inevitable fact of human existence. And what's odd is what causes our loneliness. Oftentimes, it's these things he's already warned us about. Our climb to get to the top. We throw ourselves into a rat race that requires all of our time and energy. And of course, when you use all that energy out there, you don't have any energy for here or for the community or for your friends. We've done our best to try to use technology to kind of thwart or beat off that reality. So we thought, hey, if we don't have time, you know, for real friends in real life over real dinners where we get to really know each other, we'll use technology to create and to bind ourselves together in friendship, this efficient mode of friendship. It won't take as much time and it won't take as much, uh, it will be on our terms from our own homes. But of course, we end up not sharing our true selves with one another through this and neither do others. And our interactions, you'll notice, through all the studies done, don't leave us feeling more connected. They leave us feeling envious and more alone, more disconnected and isolated, even though we have thousands of friends. We were made as human beings for community. And that was before sin. We don't just need people because we sinned and the world's hard now. We needed people before we sinned. It was not good for man to be alone from the very jump. But of course, after sin, friendship and community get a whole lot harder because we do abuse our power. And many of us have been abused by power in one form or another because we do envy and climb and it's hard to love people that you're in competition with. Friends are hard. I mean, Paul Tripp is right that relationships are a mess. Uh, He's also right that they are worth making, but relationships are hard. And they are messy. 
and they are painful. And the author of Ecclesiastes would agree with all that, and he would say, and they're still better. It's still better than being alone. C.S. Lewis put it this way, friendship is the greatest of worldly goods. Certainly to me, it is the chief happiness of my life. And if I had to give a piece of advice to a young man about a place to live, I think I should say, sacrificed almost everything to live where you can be near your friends. See, the way that we function now isn't best. We can sense that it needs fixing. And the author would tell us, look, it's better to live in community with other people. It's a better alternative to isolation. And even though pain will be caused in relationships, it's not nearly as painful as being all alone. He goes on to say then, wisdom is better. And this will be quick before we get to our second and last point. I know this felt like a lot of points, just the first point. Wisdom is better. And he compares a novice to an elder, a pauper to a king. And if you've read wisdom literature, if you have an old king versus a poor youth, the wise one is surely going to be the old king. But he says, you know what? You know what's better? It's better to be a wise, poor, young person than an old, proud king who can no longer learn anything. He says, wisdom is better than folly. It really is better to be wise and have your eyes open to the world. But he says, even that, while better, isn't best, because people will forget about the good kings too, not just the ones that were foolish. And so, if those are four betters, our final point this morning is that we're left wanting more than better. I've mentioned it before, but I grew up with this saying from my grandmother, good, better, best, never let it rest till your good is better and your better is best. I didn't take it to heart, but she said it a lot. Um, But the teacher comes this morning bringing wisdom from this world. He really does. And the wisdom is helpful. It is better to live this way. And I would encourage us all on that track. But it's also revealing. It is better to be content. It's better to be content than to be a climber who can never rest, who can never enjoy what they have. It's better to have friends on the journey of this life. You will need them when the time comes. It's better to be wise, especially wise enough to know that you don't know everything. But from the beginning of his teaching, we know that while some things are better, better just isn't enough. If the first better that he gives us is death or non-existence, then there's something in us that says this can't be all that there is. If that's what's better, to either not be here or to be gone already, then there has to be something better than better. And he wants to put before us, or at least us, leave us aching for something more. We need more than better. The fact is we were made for more than the better he offers us here, but a sin-cursed world can never offer us the best. Surely death will end our suffering, but deep down none of us wants to die. And even those who do only do so because they want to die to truly live or to get away from a life that's worse than death that they can't find here. Yes, contentment with what we do have is great gain, but we wish we didn't lack at all. We wish our toil lasted. We wish the green monster of envy didn't rise up in our hearts and would shut up already and that we weren't so pained by other people being enlarged in front of us. Friends are great. Community really is a blessing, but it also hurts. People die. People move. Friendships break down, and burnt bridges can't always be rebuilt. And wisdom is better than folly. But all the wisdom in the world can't fix the mess of this world, and it can't give us a name that lasts. The ugly reality that Ecclesiastes is showing us is that even better just isn't good enough. We need something more than that, and that is what has been given to us, truly, if you can hear me, people of God, in the good news of Jesus Christ for us. Notice the oppressed had tears, and there was no one to comfort them, no one to fix their dire situation, but we, who all life long have been oppressed by sin, the devil, and his whole domain, We who all life long have been placed into this life, which Calvin says is no more than a constant death, we now have a comforter. We have, according to John, an advocate with the Father. And if anyone sins, this advocate comes and he's a propitiation for our sins. He defends us. He covers us. He brings us comfort and salvation. He doesn't just stand at a distance, nor does he come just speaking kind words. 
He comes giving himself for us in order that we might be comforted. He stood in our place and took not only our guilt, but he bore the shame that comes with this life. A life where we have hurt others and it shames us in the way that we've done it. A life that comes with us being hurt by others and all the scars of the shame that that causes as well. And this one, Christ the Righteous One, sits at the right hand of the Father and His wounds daily plead for us before God, have mercy on Him, have mercy on her, do good to her Father. This one who sees all of your tears, and according to the Scripture, He collects everyone until all of those wrongs will be righted. He will finally wipe every tear from your eye at the resurrection of all things. This one has all power and authority and honor and name that is above every name. And instead of holding us down with it, which has been the track record of mankind in the main, instead he laid down his life in order that we might be raised up with him and shared with us the same honor that he has without an ounce of earning or deserving on our part. This one cares preeminently for the orphan and the widow and the outcast and the abused, those who have been held down and mistreated. And he's gathering them into his kingdom liberally. He is not ashamed to call them brethren, though the rest of the world ignores their pain or uses their pain for their own advancement. When all other helpers fail and comforts flee, the Anglican hymn writes, Help of the helpless, oh, abide with me. See, we are striving here for scraps, staying up at night, trying to figure out ways to gain more and not to lose what we have. We're trying to get ahead and stay there at least hoping others fail if we fail, hoping that will not make us, hoping that somehow that will finally make us feel whole. But this one, who was rich beyond all splendor, for our sakes became poor. In him there is no one-upmanship, there is no competition. For him, equality with God was not something to be grasped because he is God. But for you, he gave up all of that honor by adding to himself a human nature. And in action, he gave himself for you. To where the author of Hebrews can write, you have every right to be content. Keep your lives free from the love of money. Be content with what you have. And he says, you know why you should be content with what you have? Because God said, I will never leave you or forsake you. He says, you can be content with what you have because God has given himself, not just for you, but to you. He says, I am yours. I am your possession. I have bound myself to you by promise. The psalmist says it so rightly, who am I in heaven, O Lord, but you And beside you, I desire nothing on earth. Friends are wonderful, a true gift. But friends break our hearts and we break theirs from time to time. And through death and distance and misunderstanding and sin, we often grow apart. But in Christ, we have a friend who sticks closer than a brother. A friend who has truly seen you on your worst days and is still here. A friend whom you've truly offended on multiple occasions, more times than you even know, who still shows up first thing in the morning with a greeting and a smile and a full absolution. You, by the grace of God, are a friend of the triune God, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Wisdom is better than folly, but our wisdom is lacking. And our folly is ever-present, but Christ has become for us our wisdom and our righteousness and our sanctification. And by that cross-bent wisdom is guiding our lives in such a way that not a hair can fall from your head apart from the will of his Father in heaven. And he will not forget your name, though the whole world will. He will rejoice over you on that last day, even as he rejoices over you now, not because of what you've done but simply because he has chosen to love you. You see, Jesus is the more that we need in a world where better just isn't good enough and it's never going to be good enough. And the teacher of Ecclesiastes wants to set us free from thinking that you're ever going to find good enough here. 
And once he smashes that illusion to say, now you can finally embrace what's best, Christ for you and Christ in you, the hope of glory. Let's pray.